Hi, I'm Julie Hyman, anchor at Yahoo Finance. Welcome to the conclusion and really the capstone of Verizon's Ready for Anything commencement series. We have featured industry titans across business, nonprofit, and sports. And this series came together from one simple question. What can we do to have real conversations right now with students during this really challenging time in our world's history? The answer was to provide you with direct access to people we admire over the last four weeks. You've heard from William Lauder of Estee Lauder, NFL coach Katie Sowers, Kevin Love of the NBA, and Global Citizen co-founder Hugh Evans. While we know all of this isn't exactly the graduation celebration you'd imagine, we hope that you have found and will find value in connecting with some of the greatest minds and problem solvers that we know. Today, you're gonna to have a special treat and hear from Verizon CEO Hans Vestberg, as well as former president Bill Clinton. As we talk, uh, please send us your questions in the comments section by sharing your name as well as your university, and we will take some of those questions. Now, I wanna introduce to you now Hans Vestberg. I know him a bit um, as he is my boss up the chain a bit. He's the chairman and chief executive of one of the largest telecom companies in the world, Verizon Communications. Previously, he was the president and CEO of Ericsson, which is a Sweden-based networking and telecom company. And he's also passionate in terms of various causes, probably chief among them sustainability. He is a member of the Leadership Council of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And in that role, he helped author the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So Hans, want to bring you in now. Please share your thoughts with the graduates. Uh, hey, class of 2020, congratulations. I don't think that any one of you can even imagine your last semester uh, being as it has been. Uh, multiple crises uh, impacting the last semester of something that for you would be a, a very joyful last semester, hopefully. Um, that's why we also decided to uh, try to do some comfort. We know that uh, a virtual commencement address will not solve that and will not make it much easier, but at least a way to give back in these times. And, uh, and uh, any student that has fought so hard for many years, of course, deserve that type of address. And um, we had a uh, long address of great uh, speakers the last couple of weeks here. And uh, I'm proud to share this last address together with the president, uh, Bill Clinton, and share a little bit what we see around us. So let me start by uh, talking about the crises as we see. Uh, we headed into this year and we started uh, with a pandemic that uh, is, is fearful. It, it's so tough I mean, uh, leads to fatalities across the globe. And uh, it's the biggest pandemic uh, we have seen in, in centuries. And it's still here and it's still lethal. And we just need to understand how that impacts us. And that subsequently, of course, also impact our economy. We have the biggest downturn also in the century. We are in depression mode, we have negative GDP. That's also a crisis. And all that, of course, uh, uh, made uh, your schools uh, to not continue and you continued with virtual learning. And very recently, uh, we also saw um, demonstrations to end sort of a century long injustice for racism. All this is happening at the same time. And uh, you can feel that it's too much in a times like this. And uh, it is challenging times. And we need to solve all of these challenges. And we just need to come stronger out of this. As you can hear right now, I'm a born optimist. And I, I, I believe and I hope that when we come out from this, we come out stronger and better as the world, as a country, as individuals. But the pain we're feeling right now across the globe and here in the United States is really tough. And we all feel it every day. I think a lot about what, what could be the tools, what, what we need to think about. I have two tools that for me is extremely important in these times that I want to share with you and uh, that I are using every day. The first is leadership. And the second is human connections. 
when it comes to leadership, uh, that's something that in these times of crisis is even more important. I look for presence, visibility, and transparency in leadership. No leader, regardless if you lead a small organization, a large organization, or you're among friends, uh, you don't have all the answers, but you need leaders that leads. And in these times, it becomes even more important to lead. I've learned through my years that uh, leadership is a profession, as any profession. I mean, you are an expert in technology, marketing, accounting, whatever you have been studying. Leadership is also a profession that you need to perfect and you need to develop over the years and you need to do it in your way of leading. I was born and raised in uh, Sweden, small city in the northern part of Sweden. Uh, that's my background experience. All my childhood, uh, all the way to college, sports was the only thing that I really uh, dreamt of and fought for. I tried to be a, a sort of an elite sportsman in the team sport that I was practicing. I, I did okay, but I was never close to be equally high, high up in that hierarchy as I dreamt of. But uh, it learned me a lot about uh, competition and it learned me a lot about leadership. Leadership in, in the most uh, exciting and competitive moments, how you deal with different individuals in those moments and how you see through all of these different diversities that you have in a team uh, in order to bring out the best. And I think that's where my start of uh, interest for leadership and the importance of leadership started. Uh, I then started to work for Ericsson and Ericsson is the global telecommunication company uh, employees in 180 countries, a truly global building a 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G networks in the world. I started uh, checking travel expenses. That was the first thought I had, coming with a very competitive, competitive angle into that. And I, I was proud of that. And here, my first lesson of leadership came. I, um, I was very competitive. I checked the travel expenses together with the colleagues in the travel expense department. And uh, very soon, I think it was a couple of weeks into it, uh, my manager came in and he told me, Hans, you're a great guy. They seem to like you. You have a lot of energy. You're all over the place. But God, you're not good at checking travel expenses. And, you know, as a new graduate, uh, your first job, getting that feedback over a month, you only thought that it was one way out. And that was to, that he would say, you're, you're not the right person. You cannot continue to work here. But this leader, he told me, Hans, we're going to use your great assets that you have. And that's where we're going to put you. I know another place, another department where I think you can be really good. And I learned from him already by then. Every individual have competence and values that you need in a corporation, a team, an organization. And you need just to see that you understand that and bring it forward. And that's even more important in times like this when we discuss about diversity and inclusion. We need to see all individuals and bring them together. We need diversity and inclusion to solve some of these crises that we're talking about right now. They're so important. That was my first lesson uh, as a leader. And, and of course, uh, I'm still grateful from that leader that actually saw that I had some competences that I could drive forward. Then I embarked on a, on a journey, uh, an international journey. I lived in China, I lived in Brazil, I lived in Mexico, Argentina, Chile, United States, Mexico. I worked with many different things. And I worked with uh, everything from uh, accounting to HR, to strategy, to sales, to uh, pure strategy. Uh, but I learned one thing, I liked, uh, I liked to lead people. But I also understood that before I could lead others, I needed to know myself. And that's my second learning here. If you're gonna lead other people, you need to know your strength, your weaknesses, and in order to bring people that is complementing you, not the same type of people, you need different. Remember now, I was born in a small city of the northern part of Sweden with a very limited experience. Uh, I think my, one of my first uh, uh, trips uh, I did without my parents was going to China. Uh, so, of course, my experience was very limited, but I had the uh, I had the uh, interest and I had the curiousness to learn from other cultures. And that was enormously important. And I played a, a vital role in my leadership since that day that diversity and inclusion is only going to do this world a better place. It's going to do my companies better. It's going to be my team better. That's uh, how I learned. 
I continue at Ericsson. And, and just a spoiler here. I worked for over 35 years. I've only worked for two companies. Verizon is my second company. But, they, but I had so many different experiences. So I felt that I actually was in different places. But moving from that 10 to 15 years I was abroad, I came home to executive management and I, I come to the uh, higher sort of levels of, of Ericsson and uh, I, I was a division head and I was very ambitious and I would say fairly young uh, uh, compared to today. And uh, of course, my, my job uh, was to lead a full division, a large division, and I was very ambitious and uh, and very competitive. And uh, I, I, here I have the lesson three when it comes to leadership. and my. My, the CEO by then, uh, Carl Henrik Swamber, he called me in and he, he wanted to have a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, you're going to get feedback, how it's going. So I was excited. And I, he told me, oh, Hans, you're doing great. You have good performance. You're creating a good team. Okay, great. And then he asked, uh, so do you ever want to be the CEO of Ericsson? And I said, yeah, that would be interesting. Yes, I was ambitious and very competitive. And he, and he responded back to me, that will never happen. You will never be the CEO of, of Ericsson. And of course, with my surprise, I asked why. And he said, hey, if you're going to uh, be a, a leader of a, of a bigger, you need to lead in all directions. You need to lead the people below you, on the sides of you and above you. Right now, you're knocking down all your colleagues because, in order of showing how competitive you are. I learned from that day, you always need to deal with all stakeholders and see that you bring them together, regardless where they are. Uh, and, uh, and who they are. That has become for me a mantra. And uh, I, I, I still today, and I learned from that day, I carry my badge. This is my Verizon badge. On the back side of my Verizon badge, I have 41 names. I count in the US three cents. Of people, internal, external, above me, on the sides and below me, that is really me, are the, doing uh, the most defining things for me and working in my team. And I need to call these people every week at least once to talk to them and see how they're doing. That was the learning for me in the leadership. Again, it's about human connections as well. And human connections is equally important in the leadership to see all individuals through it. And these 41 individuals are for me absolutely crucial for the success of the company I'm leading and for the organization I'm leading and for the task that we've had. And, and that's so important in, in my life, how I do that. So pivoting that to the human connection then, and I think that we are now facing, I would say, a, a, a reimagination of connections. I mean, uh, where of course Verizon and, and a lot of things are happening in our network since this crisis has started. And I just give you a couple of stats to under, for you to understand. I mean, we have 800 million calls a day in our network. That's twice the amount that we would have on Mother's Day, which is the highest day of the year of calls. And not only have we 800 million calls, they're also longer than normal. So people communicate enormously. We have some 9 billion messages uh, daily during this pandemic. And that's uh, more than we would have on New Year's Eve. And we had 1,200% growth in collaboration tools in the network since the pandemic started. And it tells me that the, the human connection with technology is now so important for us to see that we can do our work, to be with our friends, uh, not only that, to actually execute on our businesses or seeing that we're supporting communities and society. And that's really where I come from in my human connection and as a, as a tool, which I'm so important. And I. Somewhere uh, in 2008 or 9, worked a lot in Africa. I worked with the Millennium Development Goals. That was the precursor of the Sustainable Development Goals that we have today, uh, that all nations have signed up to. Uh, and I was in a village in Africa, and I saw the healthcare worker having a mobile phone and talking to all the people in the village and, pick, uh, and putting all the data in and send it backwards in order to be more directional in the remedies and action that was needed to, to cure uh, diseases, for example. I was so excited by that. So I learned from that day that mobility broadband and the cloud is the 21st century's infrastructure in order to combat some of the largest challenges that we have on these earth. 
they're not the only one, but they are the tools. They are the, the foundation. And that's why I call them in 21st century infrastructure. And when I was part of the discussion, what are the new targets for all the governments in the world? There's 17 sustainable development goals. I was fighting hard for goal 18, that every country and every citizen should have mobility, broadband and cloud. Uh, services because then we can communicate and it doesn't matter where you're born and where you come from uh, you should have the equal opportunity we didn't get the goal 18 as you might know by now but inside all these goals that leads up to make a better world and everybody has an equal chance mobility broadband and cloud is in there and i think that for me has been also uh, how we continue to advocate and not everyone has mobility broadband and cloud today but uh, we are on our journey and we just need to continue to see that everybody is connected and have a chance to get uh, tele telemedicine, uh, healthcare uh, remotely or education remotely, regardless of what they're. Because there is not certain we can have this, the pace of building sort of a analog world for everyone. We just need to see that everyone have the same chance, whatever there are. And we have proven in this crisis that a lot of those paradigm shifts are happening. And hopefully this is moving us towards that moment. But again, it's about humans and about connections. So class of 2020, this is in your hands because the century and the 21st century's infrastructure is in your hands and the human connection is in your hands. How are you gonna take this forward? How are you gonna see that this world is going to be a better place? I'm gonna do my work. I'm gonna continue with my responsible business in our company to see that we are doing better every day and taking on the four stakeholders all the way from employees to customers to shareholders and society. And having that in front of me every day, I take the decisions. But we need the next generation, you guys, to think about how to use these human connections in, in leadership to bring this world, world to a better place. Even though it looks very dark some days now, we just need to come out of this stronger. So in summary, unprecedented times requires unprecedented actions. And that's what we need right now. And I want to end by again, congratulating you all to the graduation. And I also want to shout out to my son that also graduated from high school virtually very recently. And so I feel, and I feel a lot for you guys because I know how hard the last semester has been for you. So once again, thank you very much and congratulations. And we want to take some questions for Hans and ask some questions to him. Again, if you would like to ask a question of Hans, you can put your name as well as your university in the comment section on LinkedIn, and we will get that question and we will ask him. So let's bring Hans back in. Hans, I actually have a question for you to kick it off, because as someone who um, immigrated to the United States, as someone who worked globally, I'm curious what advice you would have for graduates who are looking to perhaps work outside of their home country. If there's any tips that you could give them, um, right now it might be even trickier than usual because of the closure yeah. of some borders and such, but you know, what are some things they can potentially do? I think it starts with, uh, you should do what you really are interested in and what, uh, what things you, you, you think is fun, because ultimately you're gonna spend a lot of time working in your life and uh, the most important is actually all that time you're going to work, you're going to feel connected to the purpose of the company, the organization you're going to work for. Uh, that's what I felt from the beginning. And I, I was curious uh, and uh, I, I love to work with different culture. And that took me on that journey. So, of course, it was an easy choice, uh, my first choice as a company to work for a very international company. So, again, it comes back to uh, you should do what you feel you're interested and excited about because that's going to make your life much easier and you're going to perform much better. And that has been my advice to anyone I've talked about. And I have done a lot of lateral move in my life in order to get just continue to learn. Uh, and I think that has for me been extremely rewarding. Let's see. Um, we have a, a question. What skills or qualities will help me move from a rank and file employee into a leadership role? I get that question a lot. I mean, I, I, move to a leadership role. I, I, I think I tried to mention that. First of all, you need to see 
that if you want to be a leader, it comes with a huge responsibility. You're going to lead other people and, you, and, and they're going to trust you. So you, you need to have a desire to lead people. That's and, and you need to find joy in a leader on the people. That's number one. Then what qualifications you need. I think, again, you need all type of diversity in a company. You need, uh, I usually get what type of uh, backgrounds and, and, the, uh, and the competence that you do you need. We need all. I mean, if, if I look at my company right now, we need all diversities. That's how you create a great company. And that also goes for leaders. But the only thing I would ask for any leader, if they want to be a leader, is you need to think about it as a profession. You need to develop yourself. You need to understand the responsibility you take by leading others that actually come to work or come to the team or come to anything every day and they look up to you to lead. And you, you need to understand that's a huge responsibility. And a very deliberate one, it sounds like, which is an interesting <laughs> perspective on it. Um, let's see, Jason asks, what quality or habit served you best as you started your career. I, I'm curious just if I can add a little spin on that. Are, are there any sort of routines or things that you've maintained through the years that have, um, so on the professional side, are there habits that have helped you? But I'm also curious on the personal side, are there things that have helped you sort of maintain an even keel um, in tough times? Yeah. Yeah, there are models. I mean, I, there are two things that I, I usually talk about. And again, it comes back to my leadership by the philosophy. One is uh, um, I know that my strength is, of course, empower and uh, and uh, and giving energy to my organization. If I work with the UN or if I work with Verizon, it doesn't really matter. Um, I, I have uh, constantly over 10, 12 years had a mood indicator where I measure myself every day to see uh, how I feel because ultimately... Oh, everyone has a bad day. And of course, if I have a bad day, you know, that's not good because my strength is to give energy. So I actually measure myself every day. I have a spreadsheet that is this long, you know, for 12 years, for every day I measured myself from one to 10. And I usually share that with my leaders because everyone has a, a, a down day and a great day. And for me, that's a way for seeing that I need to know myself. I'm going to lead some others. The other thing that I've done a long time as well is that for a leader, it's extremely important to spend the time on what really matters. And it's very easy to fall back and do things that you're good at and that you feel that that that, uh, that, that is easy. Uh, I have measured my time the last 10, 15 years, and I actually do a forecast how I should spend my time in order to spend time on the things that really matters for my organization and what I'm supposed to do. And that doesn't really matter. It's me. It's individuals, uh, leaders, or if you have a small team or big team, doesn't really matter. But for me, it has been important to see that I spend enough time externally with shareholders, with employees, with society, with customers, uh, and I have a blend, blend of governance of the company, not only ending up and doing one thing. So I steer my time. I think that's two of the tools that I've used. But again, it's it's based on who I am and how I lead and the strengths and weaknesses I have. That can be totally different for others. That's why I say that leaders doesn't need that one mode, but you need to know yourself and how you trigger and improve yourself. Um, we have Pat from Williams College who says, Hans, you said you started in the travel expense department at Ericsson. How did you work your way to become the CTO? And this also kind of touches on a theme that many of our speakers have talked about, which is sort of a combination of fate or whatever you want to call it. In your case, him telling you you weren't good at the travel expense department and then also deliberate action. So how did that path work for you? First of all, a lot of good leaders that has always looked at my strength and, 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 uh, and, and moved me around to give me the opportunity. And I, I, I have all them to thank. And of course, a lot of luck. Uh, but also that I was curious. I was extremely curious to learn more all the time. Even though I was doing travel expenses, I probably did five other things at the same time. And that's me. And I, and I like that. And that's how I also uh, very early on became very excited on technology. Uh, and uh, and being into 5G right now, which I, I, I just love to talk about. I think it's just where you come from and how you do it. And then I took a lot of decisions. I, mean, I moved between countries where, where I, to be honest, where I came from, I heard them on the, on the, in the lessons on school, but I've never been there. I, mean, I, I was forced to learn languages that I've never spoken before in order to have a chance to operate in that culture. So, of course, I've taken 
uh, steps uh, and decisions that that have been very uncomfortable and there have been times that I have been felt that maybe I give up and this is not really working out for me but uh, ultimately I did what I really liked and I had fun uh, and uh, and uh, and I found a way that I, this is really who I am and I like to lead people and that was sort of I fortified uh, my career and uh, and again it's all about that uh, life on this planet you, you you should find your things that you are finding satisfying and, and that doesn't mean it has to be what i'm doing it's what you're going to be doing with your background and where you come from so pretty writes in to ask what would be your advice to new grads to search for jobs in the uncertain environment that we have today uh, that's a, a good question and of course that's a tough question given what we see uh, not only here in the United States in the rest of the world where unemployment is high and it's especially hitting uh, the youth. Uh, I would say again uh, expressing what you're interesting for because employers always going to look for people uh, that are applying that really are passionate on what they're going to do with that's if you're a marketeer or an accountant or whatever saying that this is really what I want to do and and of course express that and I think uh, that's going to be tough these times, but uh, don't give up. Patience uh, and the right uh, attitude takes you a long way. So I understand it can look a little bit gloomy right now, but uh, as I said, I'm a born optimist. And I think that uh, we're going to come stronger and better out of this for the whole world uh, when it comes to equal opportunities and all of that. So uh, clearly uh, hang in there, but think about your interests and what is what you're passionate about. Uh, Shoba writes in to say, who do you look up to for inspiration or mentorship? I think that uh, the one that I have looked most to is my father. He, uh, he was my coach when I was from I was five, six years old until I was about 20 years old. He followed me all my way from my youth. I was a senior player on fairly high level uh, as a coach and he taught me all the things about teams, uh, combinations, diversity, bringing everybody in, seeing the best in all. I think that's the one that has brought uh, the most impact on me as a person. Then I have a, a luxury to meet uh, the world leaders of this world, all the CEOs, etc. And I, I pick and choose the best I see from them. So it's no particular mentor from them. But I have a, a unique opportunity to learn from all of them in order to uh, improve myself as a leader, because that's my job. I need to continue to improve. This is actually a good seg segue into this question from Vikram. What is your motivation and what would you count as success in the end? <laughs> For myself? Yeah. Uh, in general. Uh, I think that success is, uh, it could be so much varying things. I think that uh, uh, what I like and where I feel the most uh, gratitude is, of course, when you have a common goal in a team and, and you succeed with that goal. I think that's when I have the most joy when I see that all of us has been contributing to that success. So they can be small goals and small successes. It could be large successes. Uh, so that's how I uh, try to find joy in in the in the in sort of the small moments as well. But uh, obviously, uh, the work that I have today, you 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 always look for new uh, successes and and improve every day. I mean, it's not like you look backwards and how oh, great, you know. You, you don't see that. You just continue to find the new ways to improve and to do better. That that's uh, that's a drive. And as long as I have that drive, I I, I like to do what I'm doing. Um, a bigger pic picture question here from Bishoy. Um, how hard was it as a leader of a Fortune 500 company to pivot during uncertain times? I mean, when you are piloting a ship as large as Verizon, um, sometimes it can be difficult for, when you're the head of a very large organization to make a, a quick change when it's necessary. No, you're right. And leaders are also good in different times. Uh, 
Uh, I think the fortune we had, we had already defined our purpose and our values of the company. That, that is what is defining you in good times and in bad times. You need to keep that as tight, the culture of the company and the, and the purpose. We have that clear for us. But we also took a couple of very uh, decisive decisions very alone. Number one in this crisis, our employees' safety and health is number one. That's what we're going to prioritize as number one. And secondly, we decided we need to keep the networks up. As I spoke, you know, uh, this country and the world is relying on connectivity to do the work, to be in connection with the friends, families, to actually uh, be existing in this world right now. So we need. So those were the two priorities uh, we had. And then we also had the priority to actually contribute to the society in a crisis. That's when responsible businesses actually do uh, right things. And ultimately, take a practical business decision. We did acquisition in the middle of this. Uh, so do you need to manage all of this in a crisis? But clearly, that was the priority list we had. Another unusual thing we decided, and I talked about the press and visibility and, uh, and transparency. We decided that, that every day at noon, somewhere in February, we decided that. We have a live webcast for all our employees. It's actually external as well. Uh, in order to talk about what's happening, because the uncertainty needed it. And, and 13 weeks later, we're still running it every noon. I was on every day for 11 weeks myself. Uh, nowadays, they only allow me every second, second day or something like that. But ultimately, it was about taking uh, unprecedented actions in unprecedented times. So you need to rethink whatever you have learned. So I think we have done it. We, we always try to do even better, but that's what we have done. Um, I have a question from a fellow 5G aficionado who says that he loves to talk 5G too. He also, um, I believe, happened, or let's see, Stevens Institute of Technology, Masters in Networking 2020 grad, Dan Winters. Oh, oh, um, yeah. Great. Yes, you talked about 5G and technology in this pandemic and advancements in technology. How do you keep it personal and close in leadership while also using distance communication? I mean, you just talked about the frequency of giving updates and transparency. But, you know, as we all know, it, it can be a little bit hard to connect with people in the same way when we're talking through screens. Yeah, it's right. It's right. But you learn pretty quickly. But I'm a guy that likes to be around people and, and touch and hug and all of that. So, uh, and uh, so, of course, uh, 13 weeks at home uh, is a difference. But you learn also to have those conversations one on one. And I, I use my 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 badge and the 41 names there to see that I'm in, co in constant contact. I, I reach out more than ever. I speak to more uh, of my peers of big companies and technology companies. I speak to more people internally than ever because that becomes important. But you, you miss a little bit about the emotional interaction. But uh, clearly, the, the development we've seen on, on video conferencing uh, the, the last uh, 13 weeks here, that will stick people will actually use this type of tools much more in the future in order to make their lives easier and more efficient. Uh, but that will not take away that we need to have the whole human interaction as well. This is an interesting question because it's also about the risks uh, sometimes of living in a virtual world, not necessarily when you're face to face, but when you're not. Um, Sarah says, we see so much hatred, extreme language, bullying happening every day in social media. Is it possible to build an inclusive environment in a virtual world? Yeah, it, it is. And, and of course, with all these connectivities uh, and everything being connected, there are challenges coming with it. And, and what she's bringing up is one of them uh, and uh, that you can you can hide behind it. I think we just need to be very upfront with the, uh, the youth and, uh, and everyone that that's not acceptable in our analog life nor in our digital life. We just need to say well, that's not acceptable. You treat people with respect regardless uh, where you are. And I think that's something that I was taught uh, since uh, childhood. Respect is something so important in our society. And that doesn't really matter if it's analog or digital. So we just need to continue to, to preach that and see that uh, if we see it, uh, just tell that's not okay. It's unacceptable. And uh, uh, I know that's, a, that's not a, a, a universal solution, but it has to start with us saying no to it. Uh, other than that, it will not work. 
This question kind of harkens back to what we talked about at the, uh, at the beginning. This is from Colton Schmitz from the University of Central Florida, who's also a Verizon employee. He says, what value have you gained from learning different languages? Would you encourage others uh, to learn a second language? Sounds like you didn't have a choice in the beginning when you were in school. No, and then now we need to remember that Swedish, which is a great language, is not spoken of many people. Uh, uh, usually people joke with me that I speak Swinglish. But uh, uh, anyhow, uh, uh, in order to take a tour around the world, uh, I thought uh, for me to learn other languages it made me come much closer to some of those cultures like uh, speaking Portuguese or Spanish, where I lived in Latin America for a long time. That that gave me a great lot of, of, of insights and and, uh, and I think it made me a better person uh, as well. So for me, it has been extremely important, but we also need to remember I came from a country where uh, Swedish is a small language. We, we can speak to our neighbors basically and outside that it's a, it's a limited uh, uh, usage of, of Swedish. Um, I want to get back to sustainability for a second because, let's see, Arushi from the National Institute of Fashion Technology, a recent graduate, um, she just asked kind of generally to share your thoughts regarding sustainability. But I, I would ask you as well, I, I think, while we're talking about this, do you think as a big employer that not only are you passionate about sustainability, but I also wonder the grads of 2020, I imagine are looking for these priorities on the part of their employers, right? Yeah. Um, maybe you can talk to people about what they should look for um, when they are looking to get hired by a company, but also what what should they sort of track at their employers when they want to see if that company's values align with their own? I think there are a couple of things that for me is important. First of all, the values of the company, we call it credo, uh, the credos in, in our company. That's what we stand for, integrity, respect, uh, and all of that. That's important. But uh, when it comes to how you work as a, as a corporation, I, I usually look if they have an inclusive strategy, a strategy that is encompassing all the stakeholders in the business strategy, meaning is society part of your business strategy? Uh, for obvious reason, customers is there. Are employees part of that strategy? And is uh, 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 shareholders part of that strategy? That's how I see you do actually long-term sustainable change because you need to have it all. I, I, I like philanthropy and we should do it, but when you have philanthropy separated from the corporates uh, and, and you're saying that we're doing a great things here and it's not connected to a strategy and i'll give you one example for example we do a lot of education uh, we are serving schools uh, that don't don't have uh, technology we're serving them with broadband and we're serving them with an ipad we serve them with a digital uh, stem education uh, we call it Verizon Innovative Learning. So why do we do that? First of all, we are number one on broadband. So, so we, should, we should be, that, that's our core business. Number two, uh, the youth, we want them to understand that Verizon is part of it. And number three, we want more uh, children and youth be into STEM education, especially females. So it's part of our strategy that we're doing that. And that goes for climate change as well, which we work a lot with because we think that our technology will have a, have a multiplier effect on, on, on climate change if we use technology uh, for certain things in our society. Uh, and then uh, an inclusive world where we think that if we are inclusive to all our societies in our, in, 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 in our, in our country, in our world, we're going to be a better company, we're going to be a better world. So for me, you need to look for, is that part of the main strategy of the company? And in our company, we have embedded those four stakeholders in all our stake and all our strategies. We have targets for them, we have North Star for them, where we want to go with all of them, but they go in harmony with the purpose and the strategy of the company. Hans, I want to ask you a, a little bit more about organization. You talked oh. about that spreadsheet that you keep uh, where you track your mood. Obviously, you got a lot on your plate. <laughs> And so I am curious how you stay organized, how you track your time, how you track your energy. Um, no, I do it every day myself. <laughs> I have the spreadsheet and I fill them, fill them out. I have a procedure there when I start uh, the days by filling out my spreadsheets. So I see that I track myself and, and uh, I have coding in my agenda on the different type of uh, events I have so I can categorize them 
uh, both uh, as a forecast, but also as an actual outcome. Uh, so it's part of my my procedure to actually manage my time. And and of course, that's how I store my, steer, steer my leadership team. I mean, think about coming into a crisis like this. Of course, the leadership team start very, very quickly to work with the crisis, the pandemic. I mean, how is our employees? What, what We need to bring them home. And everybody works with that. We pivoted two weeks after that. And I would say 80% of my leadership team, I said, you don't need to work with that. We have a special team work on that. I want you to to run business as usual because business as usual is going to bring this company forward and make a prosperous future for our employees for our society for our customers and our shareholders we just need to see that so i i also steer my other uh, teams around it and, and my team members do the same and i think that's so important that you have governance you have structure and again that's me that's how i lead others lead with emotions or other ways my model has been very much around structure uh, uh, in order to see that i spend the right on the right things and i stay at the organization to work with the things that are the most critical and important right now um we have talked several times since this quarantine began and every time i'm in this spot and you're in that spot we're both people who are used to traveling around a good bit more most people are used to that so during quarantine, I mean, you have these habits that you've been talking about, but what are some other ways that you've tried to stay sharp at this time and not fall into a rut because physically we're all in the same spot? Yeah, that, that's of course hard and, and, uh, and different people have different uh, opportunities. I am training a lot. I think uh, I've I try to do it almost every day. I exercise and, and uh, that's probably more than I usually do because the traveling usually took away some. So that has been my way to get my energy uh, and, and, uh, and the way to feel, uh, feel good in these times. But uh, everyone has the different ways of doing it. I mean, some uh, are consuming uh, Netflix or things like that. And that's the way my way is, is, is exercising and sport. That's really what is giving me the energy and, and and I probably have accentuated that quite uh, quite a lot <laughs> during uh, my 13 or 14 weeks that I've been at home. Um, when it comes to sustainability, to come back to that question, um, where do you think we go out of this pandemic? The focus has been so much on coronavirus, but there's been a lot of talk about sustainability as well. For example, the idea that as we have seen shutdowns in various countries, pollution levels have gone down, showing that it is possible. So what do you think are the opportunities on the sustainability front coming out of this time? I think some paradigm shifts that we're seeing in the societal behaviors uh, will be very helpful for attaining some of the sustainable development goals. Everything from telehealth to uh, uh, remote learning uh, to uh, uh, being able to not travel all the time to reduce climate change. Those will continue to be there. I don't think the new normal will will go back to exactly how it was before. And I think that uh, a person like me born in, in, in Sweden, you had the school, brick and mortar, very close to you, had the hospital, very close. So it wasn't that obvious that you use digital solution for it. I think that the only way for scaling it quickly to see that uh, each and every can do it in an efficient and sustainable way is actually to use uh, technology. I come back to my mobility, broadband and cloud. That doesn't mean that we need schools, we need uh, hospitals, but it will take away a little bit from the challenge to build all up. Then, of course, it's a little bit of a concern that the sustainable development goals that now have 10 years left to be achieved by 2020, 2030, which in generally is saying that we, that's going to be a better word for each and everyone and more equal and everybody has the same opportunity. Of course, with a, such a setback in the economy in the world, uh, we have a larger gap to, to reach those uh, targets. Uh, that doesn't mean we give up to reach those targets to make this world a better place. It just means that we need to work harder and we need to work much closer with the public, private, social, civil society together to uh, solve some of these challenges the next 10 years. Hans, that seems to be a great segue, I think, into our next speaker. So I'm going to thank you very much, Hans, for your comments and for answering all those questions today. <laughs> Thank you for all the questions, and uh, I take it from here. And uh, uh, it's a great honor, of course, to uh, introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, uh, a person who has served as one of the greatest global connectors and diplomats, the 42nd president of the United States and founder of the Clinton Global Initiative. So I would like to welcome uh, President uh, Bill Clinton to the stage.
Let's see how we make that happen. So we seem to have some slight technical problem, um, but um, I, I guess um, he will be back in a second. We had him here for a second ago, so. Here, I'll, 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 pop, I'll pop back in here, Hans. So we'll uh -huh. chat, let's, let's okay. chat a little bit more while we are. Listen, I've been doing a live show every day. And so I have become accustomed to these sorts of things happening. Even people who are very savvy when it comes to technology who forget to unmute themselves. I think that's happened to everyone at one point or another while we have been in these types of meetings. So let's just chat a bit more as we try to fix the some of the technical issues uh, with President Clinton. Um, you have talked a lot about diversity and inclusion today. And um, we were just talking about sustainability and kind of where we go from here, that this is an opportunity. And it seems like there's a real opportunity on the diversity and inclusion side as well. And I have to say, as somebody who looks um, at corporate America, um, I, you know, it's been interesting how many companies have have stepped up and said we are we are going to prioritize this. Yeah, I I, I remember um, the time when I went to the World Economic Forum for the first time. I think it was ten years ago. Oh, probably even more. I'm getting old, um, <laughs> and I was excited about this. Um, healthcare workers in Africa and the mobile phone and how easy it was actually to be much surgical on actions to to prevent diseases and know where it is instead of have no idea you know so I remember I was talking about that in in, in uh, 2008 or whatever it was at the World, uh, World Economic Forum and, and very few thought it was super exciting and I ended up sort of outside the city more rather than inside the city to talk about it um, but the evolution uh, around corporates uh, in general uh, across the globe uh, is quite astonishing. And, and, and um, I actually attended a lot World Economic Forum and, uh, and uh, the, the, the feeling of responsibility around the corporate leaders and that they are responsible, they need to do responsible business for our stakeholders. That's very different today and, and it's very good and very healthy. And we know the Edelman uh, sort of survey when you see the Law, the most important organiza 100 organizations in the world. I mean, the majority of them are large enterprises. Uh, so um, in, you might say that we should do more and quicker and faster, but clearly the evolution we have seen of, of, of corporate companies and corporate America to taking uh, actions on it, uh, I think that's very encouraging because it's not one organization that can solve the challenges that we have on earth, uh, nor one... Uh, uh, country, nor one corporation, nor the civil society. There has to be a, uh, a combination of them. And I have seen good progress on that. Uh, that doesn't mean we're done or we, we shouldn't do more, but, but clearly step forward. And that goes into the sustainability questions you're asking or uh, what other actions we need to take. Um, Hans, as you mentioned, you are an optimist and pr pretty much all of your comments have sort of indicated that optimism about where you think things are going. And as someone who has kids who are, you know, one who just graduated from high school, someone who has interaction with, with this generation, what makes you hopeful about them in particular? I'm, I'm just curious what you're, what you're seeing in them. They seem to me much more brilliant than our generation. That, that gives me a lot of hope uh, and much more educated. And, and uh, so I, 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 I have a lot of hope on the next generation. They are much more educated. They are, they are, they are savvy. They want to do things. Uh, I think that my generation uh, wasn't equally driven that, like that. And that gives me a lot of hope when I speak to the youth and I meet them. Uh, they, they are so much more educated and so much more uh, global and uh, understanding the, the the threats and opportunity in our society. So that gives me that gives me a lot of hope. That's why I was ending my my address by speaking about that the uh, the twenty first century's infrastructure is mobility broadband and cloud and human connectivity, mm -hmm. and that I pass on to all the graduates because they are the ones that's going to use that and they are the ones that uh, is going to lead us. I think that we have resolved our technical issues, Hans. So once again, I'm going to turn it over to you. 
Thank you very much. And I, I, I will introduce uh, to class of 2020, uh, or it's my honor to introduce uh, wow. someone, as I said before, have served as one of the greatest global connectors and diplomats, the 42nd president of the United States, uh, President uh, Bill Clinton. So please take the stage, Bill. Thank you very much. And let me say first, congratulations to the class of 2020 and to all the educators, the parents, the friends, the mentors who have done so much to bring them to this milestone in their lives. Whatever else you may think about what's going on, you will never forget your senior year. It will always be unforgettable for reasons that are both positive and not so positive. Your classes moved online, your routines were upended, Many important events, including in-person graduations, were canceled. And you know that you are graduating into an uncertain future. But it's not all bad. Let's look at the troubles and the positives. In just over three months, the coronavirus has claimed the lives of more than 100,000 Americans and people throughout the world. It's damaged our economy, fundamentally changed the way we live, work, study, and interact with each other. It has also laid bare many longstanding inequalities and vulnerabilities in our society, including racial and income health disparities, food insecurity, and the overall precariousness of living life under or just above the poverty line. Just as we were dealing with that, we then watched as George Floyd's life was squeezed out of it, as Ahmaud Arbery's last run turned him into hunter's prey, and as Breonna Taylor died in a hail of bullets. George Floyd's death reverberated across this country as nothing had in years, in large measure because it was captured on video by a brave, young, 17-year-old woman for all the world to see the entire excruciating eight minutes and 46 seconds of it. In response, people have flooded onto the streets to demonstrate and to demand an end to racism, not just in policing, but in every aspect of our lives. So you are moving into an already uncertain future, made more difficult by the pandemic. But as you take the next steps on your life journey, what will happen to you and what will become of us? Socrates was on to something when he said the unexamined life is not worth living. Now is a time when we all have to examine our own lives and the life of our country and the trends in the world. And we have to ask ourselves, who we really are, what we really believe, what kind of country and world do we really want for our children? And most important, what are we prepared to do about it? Even before the pandemic and the recent push for facial justice, you were entering a world of growing inequalities and divisive tribalism with people pulling pulling, pulling away from those who are different from them. Seething resentments, aggravated by inequality in our economy, our society, and dysfunction in our politics and in our information systems, empower those who inflame our worst instincts. They do it, of course, for their own power and profit, because it works but this has put your future, our democracy, and our very planet at risk. In ways large and small, people all over the world has been urged to see life as a dog-eat-dog, zero-sum game, us and them. Recent events have only revealed more starkly how little we really know about each other and how very much we have to learn. The good news, is that your generation is better equipped to take these challenges on. You have more access to information. You can learn more quickly. 
you can act together more than any generation before. I have been amazed by the resilience you've shown in facing the pandemic and truly awed by the efforts that you have made in massive crowds of all races and backgrounds who've come together to stand up for justice and equality and to stand against violence and racism. You are given new hope that we might yet succeed in our very oldest struggle. Dr. Martin Luther King said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. He might have said less poetically that it actually zigs and zags toward justice. And somebody has to be there to help bend it in the right direction. It takes mind, heart, will, and discipline. You have to remind yourself every single day of what you do not know and what you do believe. And you have to make a determined effort to reach out to others, even if it takes courage to say what you really think and feel. For all the problems you face, the last several days have shown that most Americans are good people trying to find a better way for all of us. They want the arc to bend toward justice. And your generation is doing a lot of the bending. Young people with their dreams and energy sometimes have to do that. Martin Luther King, after all, was just 26 when he rose to lead the national bus boycott at Montgomery. That was 1955. John Lewis was only 25 on Bloody Sunday. Diane Nash, the leading organizer of the voting rights campaign, was 26 when she marched in Selma. Though young, they moved millions and changed the course of history. Today, people even younger than that are in the vanguard of change. Look at those in the Black Lives Matter movement, in the movement for climate action in America and around the world in the young people from Parkland, Chicago, and elsewhere who are pushing for gun safety, in the dreamers who are demanding the chance to add to our diversity and make their contributions to America's future. You should believe, no matter how hopeless you may feel or frustrated or angry, that you can change the world for the better, because you can. As you decide how to meet these challenges, you'll be forced to reconcile your thoughts and feelings about all that and make them a part of the fabric of real life, your own individual life, the life in which you will write your own story, live your own dreams, make your own mistakes, suffer your own disappointment. The education you've received is an empowering gift I hope you'll nurture it and keep learning. And no matter what, never disempower yourself and never let anyone else disempower you. Only you can stop yourself from chasing your dreams and only you must never forget that the dreams you cherish are the dreams you should also want for other people. Really, there are no final victories or defeats in life. You'll all make your mistakes, there'll be failures. It's not given to us to win every battle. But if you fight the right fight, and if you get up and go on, you will bend the arc of the moral universe toward justice. I have great faith in you and your future. I know you've been dealt a hard hand but you can play it well. With a tough but open mind and a caring heart, you can bring us together in new ways. You can help us serve others, not run away from them. You can help to lift others up, not tear them down. You can help to dignify, not demean. 
if you do, you'll find your own path to fulfillment and happiness. And you'll breathe new life into America and the world beyond. Congratulations. Good luck. Keep at it. Thank you, President Clinton, for those words, important in these times. Um, and I thank you also for addressing uh, the, the, the students and the graduate virtually, which is a new way that we have learned through this uh, tough process. Um, I, I have some questions coming in here, so I, I'm going to ask them to you. Um, the first question is from Megan from the R Rutgers University. Um, she asked, how can leaders unite people right now in times like this crisis? How, how can leaders act to unite more? Well, first of all, if you want to lead in a crisis, you have to decide what direction you want to lead in. The leaders have to reflect the values that these young people are calling for. The leaders have to be committed to uniting, not dividing. They have to remember that diverse societies are better positioned for a complicated world than those in which everybody looks the same, thinks the same, behaves the same, and in which leaders become leaders by saying it's a world of us versus them. Leaders first have to ask, what can I do to expand the number of us and shrink the number of them? I think once you make that decision, if you listen well, people have their own ideas about the future they want, how they want to get there. But the number one thing today is to, in word and action, reflect the unity everybody says they want, but many people don't. Um. Very wise word, and I, I couldn't agree more that uh, a di diverse word is a better word and a diverse workforce, a diverse organization, all will lead to a better word. And we just need to encourage that if you want to be a leader. Uh, I have another question. It, it's written in third person. So uh, uh, Hans talked about, that's me, uh, talked about building a strong personal network. Considering the current landscape, what is your advice to graduates about the importance of building networks in times like this? It's from Katie from the American University. Well, first of all, let's just take the mountain of social science evidence. If you want to have a big impact in a positive way, diverse networks make better decisions and implement them more effectively. Why? Because we all know different things. We all have different skills. And if you put them together, there's a multiplier effect that simply does not exist if everybody stays off on their own or only stays with their own crowd. Hmm. And I think that, so I can tell you that I'll give you just an example from my own experience. In the years that we held the Clinton Global Initiative, there were tens of billions of dollars of commitments made to change the world. But, and they all started with a specific goal in mind. The commitments that were pursued by diverse networks actually on balance exceeded their goals because people were working for something positive, not trying to separate themselves from others and say how great they were. Uh, I remember when the Ebola epidemic broke out in West Africa. We got a group of people together to send 100 tons of medical equipment to the affected areas that didn't cause the United States government or any other government, any money at all. They just donated it. And someone who knew what to put together and someone who knew how to deliver it got a lot of other partners together and they did it. Before the project was over, they had delivered 
500 <laughs> tons to those three countries in West Africa. And those things just feed on each other. They just go and go. So I think it also makes life more interesting when you're within diverse groups. It's more fun and it generates more energy. But as a matter of pure brain science, diverse groups make better decisions and implement them better. Thank you, President. I would like to end here on behalf of all the graduates of the class of 2020 to uh, thank you for the address and your insightful words to the graduates so they come out in a maybe challenging word, but with encouragement that th there are possibilities uh, and uh, we should come stronger out of this uh, crisis and a better world. That's what we all need to strive for. So once again, President, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so um, I just want to end by handing back to Julie. That's going to end this uh, commencement series. But again, uh, for all the graduates, uh, I want to congratulate you. Uh, and I want to take my hat off you for all the hard work you have done. Back to you, Julie. Thank you so much, Hans. And thank you to President Clinton as well. Um, uh, graduates of 2020, I hope that you all have as enjoyed and gotten as much out of these conversations as I have. I'm not a graduate, obviously, but I have found them very insightful and helpful, even at this point in my career and my life. You can, by the way, re-watch any of these conversations on Verizon's LinkedIn page and its other outlets, so please feel free to do so. Um, and lastly, I, I just want to congratulate all of you to echo Hans's sentiment about my optimism for the future. I see you in the streets. I see you on social media. I know it's a tough time, but I think that you all will rise to the challenge. So my honest, heartfelt congratulations to all of you graduates. Thank you for watching Verizon's Ready for Anything commencement series.